Hello everybody, I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and boy, is this a good one. I dropped everything, scheduled the live stream, and here we are to talk about the ACLU's amicus brief, amicus brief, whatever you want to call it, in the, uh, <clears throat> in the case of Murray Energy versus John Oliver, etc., etc., etc. So, uh, let me put this up on the screen because this is quite epic. Um, <laughs> thank you all for joining me. Uh, first, let me take a look at how many of you are here. And also, let me get some feedback on whether the audio is good or not. Uh, my bars are going on my end. Audio's perfect, according to a few people. Great. Excellent. Oh my goodness, there are 700 of you watching. That is amazing. Okay, so this is the, uh, the ACLU's amicus brief. I'm going to keep calling it that. I don't care if you pronounce it a different way. I'm sorry, it's Old Latin. So this is called the Brief Amicus Curiae of the American Civil Liberties Union of West Virginia Foundation in opposition to plaintiff's motion for a temporary restraining order and in support of dismissal and Rule 11 sanctions. Now, that's a lot. That's a lot to say. Uh, so let me go over a little bit of that. Um, it is a brief. It is a brief, meaning it is a longer memo to the court. It is not just a procedure or a pleading. It is actually a, a we're going to go in-depth into a legal analysis. It is an amicus curiae filing, which means friend of the court. It is not being filed by a party. It is being uh, filed on behalf of a of someone who is interested in the outcome, and they have to justify to the court why they think it is, uh, why they have standing to brief the court on something. Um, it is from the American Civil Liberties Union of West Virginia. They, uh, the American Civil Liberties Union, if you are unaware, is a organization, well, you'll see the description in a moment, but they fight for people's rights generally. You may or may not like them because they fight for people's rights, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. But, uh, but this is for the ACLU, and that's uh, who is standing, uh, who is... Uh, uh, filing this brief. It is in opposition to plaintiff's motion. So plaintiffs made a motion. Plaintiffs are Murray Energy. Uh, they made a motion for a temporary restraining order. Gee, we know a little bit about temporary restraining orders. So although I haven't looked at the restraining order, uh, this, um, this is a, in response and opposition to their request for some kind of restraining order. I, I assume that we'll see in this brief what the restraining order was all about. And in support of dismissal, dismissal would mean dismissal of the complaint, not just the TRO, I wouldn't think, but I would, I would guess dismissal of the entire matter. And Rule 11 sanctions, well, that's, that's big too. Rule 11 means the Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 11, which says that attorneys must, uh, basically when they put their name on things, it's more than just their name, it's their ethics and their reputation, uh, their, their, their code of professional conduct is on the line when they sign papers. So that means that they've done their due diligence, that they believe there's a meritorious case here, and that it's not being filed for frivolous uh, purposes, etc. And it's for sanctions. So sanctions would be the court responding to a Rule 11 violation or other violations of uh, the court's procedure or uh, other, other laws that are made to prevent frivolous filings. So let's go. <clears throat> So I posted the table of contents earlier. Why did I do that? Well, if you read it, it's pretty obvious. The uh, table of contents is a very good way to get an idea of what a case is about to be about. And, um, okay, good. Just sorry, I was checking chat to make sure that nothing bad was going on. Also, let me pull up my uh, feed here to make sure that my uh, stream doesn't cut out. Okay, there we go. So the table of contents starts. One. Interest of amicus curiae and required disclosures. Two, brief history of plaintiff's attempts to chill speech by abusing the legal system. To A, plaintiffs frequently abuse the legal system to attack protected speech. To B, the ridiculous case at hand. Three, 
Anyone can legally say, eat shit, Bob. 3A, plaintiff's motion for a temporary restraining order is ridiculous. Courts can't tell media companies how to report, Bob. 3A1, all of John Oliver's speech was protected by the First Amendment. You can't sue people for being mean to you, Bob. 3A2, plaintiff's requested injunction is clearly unconstitutional. You can't get a court order telling the press how to cover stories, Bob. 3B, the court should dismiss this action and assess sanctions. And conclusion. If I, if, if I sound like I'm having trouble not bursting out laughing, this is going to be an exercise in that, so I hope you're okay. So they've listed a table of authorities. This is a very helpful index for a judge and especially the judge's staff who are going to have to go through the other cases that are cited and make sure that, that, the, that the, uh, the author of this motion or brief cited the authority properly. Usually they do, but you know sometimes you have to make sure that someone's not trying to pull the wool over the judge's eyes. But right, right, on, right on this list of cases that I see here, I notice something about two-thirds of the way down the list. They're going to be citing a bunch of Murray Energy cases. So, uh, whoa, that's, no, we didn't want to do that. Um, they're going to be citing a bunch of Murray Energy cases. Apparently, I still have my redaction tool on because I'm being a nice YouTube reporter and I am redacting out names and, or redacting out addresses and phone numbers and emails so that people can't just blow off some steam by sending a, a reckless email to a party or to a party's attorney. And then they will be also citing other authorities uh, and the rules of civil procedure and the Constitution. Not a big deal. Let's get to it. Interest of amicus curiae and required disclosures. The ACLUWV is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to the principles of liberty and equality embodied in the United States Constitution, the West Virginia Constitution, and our nation's civil rights laws. The ACLU has long been dedicated to protecting the freedom of speech enshrined in the First Amendment of the United States Constitution and Article 3, Section 7 of the West Virginia Constitution. The ACLU is requesting permission to file this brief in accordance with Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 29A. This brief was authored by staff counsel for the ACLU WV and no party, party's counsel, or other person authored any parts of the brief or contributed money intended to fund preparing or submitting the brief. Plaintiffs are attempting to use this court as a vehicle to chill protected speech and silence the marketplace of ideas. For the following reasons, the ACLU WV respectfully requests the court deny plaintiff's motion for a TRO, temporary restraining order, and preliminary injunction, and issue an order to show cause as to why this case should not be dismissed and plaintiffs sanctioned. A brief history of plaintiff's attempts to chill speech by abusing the legal system. This case is about plaintiff Robert E. Bob Murray not liking a television program and somehow believing that it is a legally actionable offense. On June 18, 2017, Defendant Home Box Office aired an episode of Last Week Tonight with John Oliver, a satirical news program about current events. The main topic discussed in this episode was coal. Apparently because plaintiff's delicate sensibilities were offended, they clutched their pearls and filed this suit. Although this brief pokes fun at the absurdity of this case, the legal issues raised by it are anything but comical. This lawsuit and plaintiff's frequent attempts to use our legal system to chill speech threaten the fundamental right of the media to criticize public figures and speak candidly on matters of public concern. Speech on a matter of public concern occupies the highest rung of the hierarchy of First Amendment values and is entitled to speech protection. Plaintiffs frequently abuse the legal system to attack protected speech. It is a basic concept of free speech that you do not get to sue media organizations because you don't like their coverage. However, this is apparently a difficult concept for plaintiffs to grasp. It appears that Bob Murray's favorite hobby is suing and or threatening to sue people for making political statements he disagrees with. See Murray v. Tarley, Murray v. Knight Ritter. Dismissed, defaming action, same. Murray the versus Huffington Post, same. Murray versus Chagrin Valley Publishing, affirming dismissal. Murray versus Moyers, dismissing defamation claim. Murray versus Merge Market, merger market. 
same. Murray Energy Holdings versus Bloomberg, same. And citing Jonathan Peters, a coal magnate's latest lawsuit was tossed. After losing this long list of losses of, oh, in Ohio, excuse me, after this long list of losses in Ohio, it appears that Bob Murray has now decided to try his luck with abusing West Virginia's court system. B. The ridiculous case at hand. Plaintiff's claim does not come close to stating a claim upon which relief can be granted. See Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 12b-6. Among the myriad... Oh, oh, ooh, I'm sorry. I understand it's been, it's been, it's been updated and that I'm not right. But I still cringe whenever I see myriad of. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Among the myriad of entirely legal activi activities contained in plaintiff's petty list of grievances are the following. Defendants attempted, quote, to advance their biases against the coal industry and their disdain for the coal-related policies of the Trump administration. Defendants, quote, employed techniques designed solely to embarrass plaintiffs. Quote, defendants childish, childishly demeaned and disparaged Bob Murray and his companies, made jokes about Bob Murray's age, health, and appearance, and made light of the tragic mining accident. Quote, defendants are persons and organizations fundamentally opposed to any revitalization of the coal industry, having described coal as environmentally catastrophic. Defendant Time Warner, quote, is widely reported as a top 10 donor of Hillary Clinton. Quote, as a presidential candidate, Mrs. Clinton's agenda was to put a lot of coal miners out of, and coal companies out of business. Quote, defendants' broadcasts have vigorously supported and advanced Mrs. Clinton's agenda. Instead of focusing on what plaintiffs wanted him to talk about, defendants, quote, ignored them and doubled down, ending their recorded broadcast with the phrases, eat shit, Bob, and kiss my ass, Bob. Quote, defendant, uh, quote, defendants um, deliberately omitted the facts plaintiff provided regarding the Crandall Canyon mine incident. Quote, defendant Oliver quoted from the sweeping executive summary of an MSHA report, which obviously and grossly overstated the actual consequences contained in the MSHA report, which defendants easily would have seen upon a cursory review of the actual MHSA, MSHA report. Quote, defendants aired a clip of congressional testimony of a relative of a former employee of Murray Energy that appeared to be dissatisfied with Bob Murray's energy, Bob Murray's handling of the Crandall Canyon mine collapse. I'll get through this, I swear. There is a footnote, footnote to one of these that I missed. Astoundingly, despite complaining that last week tonight quoted an out-of-context snippet from a single report, here plaintiffs leave in only a small portion of a longer quote in a seeming attempt to mislead the, co the court and the public. And two, plaintiff's allegation that defendants should not have quoted directly from the conclusions of an official MSHA report or congressional testimony, the validity of which they do not dispute, is particularly outrageous. Thank you for the one dollar, Dan. In reference to Bob Murray's denial of an absurd story that Bob Murray claimed a squirrel told him he should operate his own mines, defendant Oliver stated, you know what, I, you know what, I actually believe Murray on that one. Even by your standard, that would be a pretty ridiculous thing to say. Quote, defendant Oliver failed to mention, despite having the information that Bob Murray has pioneered emergency response and fire suppression training in the coal industry, Defendants describe Bob Murray as someone who looks like a geriatric Dr. Evil and arranging for a staff member to dress up like a squirrel and deliver the message, eat shit, Bob, to Bob Murray. After the live taping, defendant Oliver exclaimed to the audience that having someone in a squirrel costume tell Bob Murray to eat shit was a dream come true. Defendant Oliver started, Bob Murray, I didn't really plan for so much of this piece to become about you, but you kind of forced my hand on that one. Back to the ACLU. What plaintiffs apparently fail to realize is that even if all of this is true, they do not allege defendants did anything illegal. The expressive, overtly political nature of this conduct was both intentional and overwhelmingly apparent, quoting Texas v. Johnson, a Supreme Court case from 1988. 
Ironically, the complaint outrageously claims that defendants attacked Bob Murray in a forum in which he had no opportunity to defend himself. And so he has brought this suit to try to set the record straight. In direct contravention to this claim, plaintiff Murray Energy sent out a press release about the case the very day it was filed. Two days later, Bob Murray was on national television calling John Oliver a radical elitist. No other opportunity to defend himself indeed. The complaint also interestingly claims that nothing has ever stressed Bob Murray more than John Oliver's vicious and untruthful attack. As one media outlet asked, is he really saying that a late night British comedian on a premium channel has caused him more stress than that time one of his mines collapsed and killed a group of his employees? If so, that's weird. Anyone can legally say, eat shit, Bob. This case is beyond meritless. It is offensive to the very ideals of free speech embodied in the First Amendment. The fact that plaintiffs filed this case is ridiculous enough, but to pour gasoline on the fire, plaintiff's counsel has also filed a motion asking the court to make John Oliver not say mean things about him anymore. It is frankly shocking that plaintiffs were able to find attorneys willing to file a lawsuit that is so obviously unconstitutional. It is apt that one of plaintiffs' objections to the show is, is about a human-sized squirrel named Mr. Nutterbutter, because this case is nuts. Which also begs the question, is Mr. Nutterbutter one of the 50 Doe defendants included in this action? Plaintiff's motion for a temporary restraining order is ridiculous. Courts can't tell media companies how to report, Bob. All of John Oliver's speech was protected by the First Amendment. You can't sue people for being mean to you, Bob. Thank you, Poopoy, for the tree fitty. Plaintiffs do not come close to stating an actionable claim. Defendants aired a broadcast about a matter of public concern that is undoubtedly protected by the First Amendment. It is axiomatic that the First Amendment to the United States Constitution placed limits on the application of the state law of defamation, and in particular, on the type of speech which may be subject of state defamation actions. The complaint itself makes it clear that defendant's speech was about matters of public concern, as it repeatedly alleges that defendants broadcast this episode to advance their political agenda. Speech concerning public affairs is more than self-expression. It is the essence of self-government. As such, plaintiffs must allege actual malice in order to maintain a claim for defamation. As discussed above, Last Week Tonight is a satirical news show about real news that uses comedy and strong language to make its points. The segment plaintiffs object to begins with John Oliver referring to coal as basically cocaine for Thomas, Thomas the Tank Engine. Additionally, Bob Murray objects to being compared to Dr. Evil, a comical villain in the Austin Powers movie series, and Mr. Nutterbutter the Talking Squirrel. Obviously, any reasonable person would realize that such communications are the type of critical commentary typically filled with political innuendo and should not be taken at face value or viewed as statements of fact. Opinions are protected speech. Opinions, too, are protected speech, and under the First Amendment, there is no such thing as a false idea, however pernicious a... <clears throat> excuse me. However pernicious an opinion may seem, we depend for its correction not on the conscious of judges and juries, but on the competition of other ideas. It is irrelevant that Bob Murray apparently finds this protected speech offensive. If there is a bedrock principle underlying the First Amendment, it is that the government may not prohibit the expression of an idea simply because society finds the idea itself offensive or disagreeable. Indeed, if it is the speaker's opinion that gives offense, the consequence, that consequence, is a reason for according it constitutional protection. Once again, if the speaker's opinion is that which is offensive, that consequence alone is a reason for according it constitutional protection. And with regard to the Dr. Evil remark, it should be remembered that truth is an absolute defense to a claim of defamation. Holy shit! Uh, it should be noted that the very mean comparison arose from both a striking 
physical resemblance between the two characters and a statements by plaintiff general and a statement by plaintiff's general counsel with an uncanny similarity to statements made by a more youthful Dr. Evil. Referring to a statement that plaintiff's general counsel noted that although he could not legally demand one billion dollars, the figure did reflect the potential damages of the article that gave rise to the suit. This can reasonably be interpreted to mean plaintiff's general counsel wanted to demand one billion dollars. Oh my god. <laughs> the statements plaintiffs point to are clearly not libelous. They are satire regarding a public figure regarding a matter of public concern. As a flamethrower himself, Bob Murray should not be shocked when his own fire occasionally inspires others to fire back. This is the very purpose of the marketplace of ideas. The place to disagree on important matters of public concern is the court of public opinion, not a United States district court. As one court has noted, one planning to engage in politics American style should remember the words of Harry S. Truman. If you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. And referring to another case, that statements calling the plaintiff a crook were merely rhetorical and hyperbolic language and were not actionable. So thank you to Anakin the Weird, came for the law, stayed for the Eeyore, died from the laughter. Five dollars. Thank you. And to Mark, I know I now have the image of Eeyore saying, eat shit, Bob, stuck in my head. Thanks a lot, Leonard. Thank you, Mark, for the $25 donation. I appreciate you all. Plaintiff's requested injunction is clearly unconstitutional. In, wow, how late is it? Unconstitutional. You can't get a court order telling the press how to cover stories, Bob. For reasons passing understanding, in addition to filing this action, plaintiffs compounded the abuse to our justice system and filed a motion for a temporary restraining order and preliminary abjunction. Whew! I swear this is root beer. Regular old sober, not non-alcoholic root beer. Plaintiffs request what they falsely deem the narrow and limited relief of a temporary restraining order, preliminary injunction, and gag order to restrain defendants during the pendency of this litigation from, one, rebroadcasting the defamatory statements that are subject of plaintiff's complaint, and two, publicly discussing the subject of litigation. Bob Murray thinks John Oliver was mean to him, and he doesn't want him to be mean again. While this is sad for Bob Murray, it is unconstitutional for a court to order such relief. With plaintiff's request for, one, prior restraint, that is, two, a content-based restriction, three, on a matter of public concern, four, related to a public figure, they have really hit the protected speech jackpot! The requested injunction actually forbidding speech activities is a classic example of prior restraint. See Alexander v. United States, a Supreme Court case from 93, 1993. All prior restraints on expression are presumptively unconstitutional. Prior restraints on matters of public concern are even more so. See Organization for a Better Austin v. Keefe, a Supreme Court case from 1971. To make matters worse, the requested injunction is also content-based in nature, and therefore must withstand, restrict, must withstand strict scrutiny. See Doe v. Gonzalez, a uh, District of Connecticut case from 2005. It is rare that a regulation restriction of free speech because of its content will ever be permissible. United States v. Playboy, uh, a, a Supreme Court case from 2000. That is because, above all else, the First Amendment means the government has no power to restrict expression because of its message, its ideas, its subject matter, or its contents. Police Department of City of Chicago v. Mosley, a Supreme Court case from 1972. Plaintiffs argue that defendants will use their unique powers. <laughs> dogs, and ri dogs are rice. Dogs are nice, excuse me. Says, uh, eat shit, Bob, for $2. Thank you for the donation. Plaintiffs argue that defendants will use their unique powers to access millions of West Virginians to bias the potential jurors who will determine their fate. These special powers must include magic, as West Virginia has under 2 million restaurant, restaurants. Wow. 
has under 2 million residents. I got distracted by the, uh, the $10 donation here. Uh, thank you from Padfrog, you are our favorite copyright attorney. This is amazing. Thank you for all of your videos and casts. However, although defendants have said very little about this case, this has done nothing to stop press coverage of this frivolous litigation, possibly due to plaintiff's press releases and appearances on Fox News, where closure is wholly inefficacious to prevent a perceived harm, that alone suffices to make it constitutionally impermissible. Again, where closure is wholly inefficacious to prevent a perceived, perceived harm, that alone suffices to make it constitutionally impermissible. A Fourth Circuit case from 1989 in Re-Charlotte Observer. Uh, thank you to uh, Eric Schuler. So nice to see you having fun with recent events. Thanks and keep up the good fight, my favorite copyright attorney. I appreciate that. Thank you very much for the $10 donation. The court should dismiss this action and assess sanctions. It is within the court's inherent authority to sua sponte, issue an order to show cause as to why the case should not be dismissed and sanctions assessed. I'm going to, I'm going to pause there. It is within the court's inherent authority. That means the court has the authority automatically. It does not need anyone to make a motion or uh, ask or, or get permission or anything like that, the court has the basic authority to sua sponte issue an order to show cause, to on its own issue an order requiring the opposing party, in this case, Murray Energy, to show good cause why the case should not be dismissed and sanctions assessed. When a complaint lacks, lacks allegation. When a complaint lacks allegations based in fact and law as thoroughly as here, this strongly supports, supports, supports. This strongly supports, supports a finding of improper purpose justifying Rule 11 sanctions. The primary purpose of Rule 11 is to deter future litigation abuse, such as the abuse, excuse me, of our legal system in which plaintiffs have engaged in for well over a decade. It is beyond comprehension that plaintiffs truly believe the speech at issue in this case to be actionable. In yet another libel case filed by plaintiffs, the court noted that the article in question engaged in conjecture that Murray may have acted out of spite, which begs the response of, so what? John Oliver was mean to you, Bob. So what? <clears throat> Conclusion. Humans dislike self-directed criticism. The intolerance within all of us can oversuppress speech, which is otherwise useful, either to the speaker or to a listener. Citing Moore versus City of Kilgore, a Fifth Circuit case from 1989, Bob Murray needs to be taught that our judicial system is simply not the place for harassment and petty grievances. The ACLU WV therefore respectfully requests that this court deny plaintiff's motion for a temporary restraining order and issue an order to show cause why this case should not be dismissed and plaintiff's sanctioned. Respectfully submitted, Jamie Lynn Crofts of the ACLU of West Virginia. Well, Jamie, that is an impressive piece of work there. I am seriously, seriously impressed. If you can't hear it in my voice, I am like giddy over this pleading, uh, uh, over this filing. This is absolutely, absolutely amazing. So I don't have anything else prepared, so hit me with your questions in chat. I'll hang out here for a moment. I'll start some music or something, and we can have a conversation for a little bit. I don't plan on making this another hour and a half long like many of my other live streams, so please uh, send in your questions if you got them. Otherwise, I'm going to kick you all out of here in about 15, 20 minutes at the most. Let's find some of that music that I had going before. I have to turn down mine, so you guys yell at me if this is too loud, because I can't hear it.
Okay, so I've got my audio on. Somebody yell at me if the uh, if if my audio is not high enough to overcome the music, or if the music's just simply too loud. I will be watching chat, which is somewhere here. I swear. There we go. Spongeworthy, is it unusual for third parties to file amicus briefs at this early stage in a litigation? Um, it's not that it's unusual or usual to file an amicus brief at a, uh, you know, at a, at a certain stage of litigation. It's whenever it's appropriate. In this case, plaintiff made a, re a, a request for a temporary restraining order. If you followed my Alex Maurer live streams, I personally made, well, well, personally, on, I'm, I, on behalf of Imago Softworks uh, and Don Thacker and Imago Films, um, made a, uh, a temporary restraining order request myself, and we won ours because it was quite meritorious. The, bar, the, the standard for a temporary restraining order is extremely high, and they should be granted in the rarest of events. So the fact that the ACLU is filing an amicus brief is one of two things, and this is not to be mean to the ACLU in any way. I do like the ACLU. Uh, first, I think this has merit. I think they are, are the ACLU is well versed in free speech law. They like to practice free speech law, so this is a great opportunity for them to get that practice. Two, this may be a bit of good publicity for the ACLU. Look, I'm reporting on it. Others are going to report on it. The ACLU is going to get some donations. This is going to work out well for the ACLU as well. Not, not to, to belittle or discount at all what they're doing. I'm just saying it's really it checks all the boxes. It's not just in their interests on one side. It's also in their interests on the other. Um, a lot of cases work out that way. You may remember that uh, the Rosa Parks case, uh, there was a, a, a another Rosa Parks case candidate before Rosa Parks came along. She just wasn't as great of a candidate for litigation. I believe she was a single, mo a pr a single mother or, or something like that, and that wasn't uh, looked, looked, looked well upon at that time. <clears throat> I disagree with that, but that's how that happened. So thank you for the donations. Uh, I think I see Matthew East, and I think I see uh, Tactical Bra. Um, Tactical Bra asks, uh, yes, I'm going to skip, I'm sorry. How often do legal arguments briefing of this have this level of sass? Um, often enough, usually when they warrant it. You have to remember you're writing to a judge, so if you make it fun for the judge to read, as long as you've not made the fun, you know, dis discount or, or take away from the meritorious arguments you're helping your reader get through it look look at look at look at this right here I mean how many people are on this thing right now on my stream there are 1400 people 1400 people here who are interested in this pleading because it was written well that's that's really the essence of being a lawyer is not just knowing the legal arguments but being able to present your case to a judge and not have them get bored with you and throw you out um, or stop reading which is some of the worst things that can happen lint how can the plaintiff claim the production was trying to mislead the court if the court wasn't involved at the time of the show i think they're saying that the production was um continuing to be broadcast and therefore more and more people were finding out about it and therefore it's misleading the court now, not then. Um, is Warren, she says, is the audio sync off? Yes, the audio sync seems to be always off on a live stream. I always have it set on my end properly and then for some reason it's off elsewhere. When I record, it's it's... I'm sorry, it just happens to be that way. When I record, I usually have to adjust by uh, one or two frames, not uh, 300 milliseconds, which is eight or nine frames. So something else is going on. I, I don't know what. It pro it's probably uh, the capture device or the OBS. Um, Tyler Burney asks, are you allowed to have such hilarious or unprofessional documents in court? Uh, yes, I, I, and... and, and Yes, I just answered that, I know, but I, I wanted to stress this. It, it's, it's appropriate if you keep it to an appropriate level. Uh, at some point in the future here, I'll be going over the Star Trek opinion, which is where a judge wrote a whole opinion laced with Star Trek references. 
just for the fun of it. I guess they got bored. So, hey, as long as the legalese is sound, as long as the, the, the legal procedure and, and, and logic and analysis is all sound, I'm not too worried about. Padfrog, Padfrog asks, how are you so awesome? Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your opinion that I am awesome. Not everyone has always thought so, and uh, maybe that's why I'm awesome, because I've just tried so hard to overcome all the haters. I don't know. Presumably, we have been removed to federal court at this point. Oh, yes. Good point. I skipped this. Um... We were not in, in federal court a moment ago, were we? And I, I, I didn't look at the docket for this or go into any of that. This was filed originally in West Virginia state court and was then removed to federal court, I'm assuming, by the defendants. All you have to do to remove something to federal court is literally file a notice of removal and, and then it, the case gets moved. The state court case must be put on hold while the uh, while the while the uh, federal court is dealing with it. Yes, the federal court can disagree with the removal and dismiss the removal and send it back to to state court. The the federal court could also totally dismiss the action with prejudice, meaning no one can ever file it again, and the state court action is dead. Spongeworthy says, ease down on the root beer, it's only Tuesday. You don't understand, I rushed to the store today to get there before everyone else and get my case of root beer because this stuff is popular. And if I, you know, you know while we're thinking about it, hey, Brandon, we might want to contact uh, Appalachian Brewing Company and tell them what a fan I am of their root beer and see if they want to uh, sponsor us by sending me a couple cases a month. Anyway. Dogs are nice says, it's short for dogs are nice. It was almost 10 years ago when I came up with this, okay? Please get it right. Okay, dogs are nice. Thank you very, very much. I actually really appreciate that. I run a channel called Such Dogs. I'm in the middle of posting a 41 minute uh, uh, dog pool party. And as soon as I get done with this stream, that upload is going to be restarted. It's literally sitting in the background right now of all of my windows waiting for the encoding to finish. Um, next, what sort of sanctions do you imagine the ACLU is looking for? Well, the judge is going to try to determine what the appropriate sanctions are. Usually that is some kind of monetary uh, damages or monetary sanctions in a case like this. When you have criminal activity, then you can reach actual jail time and things as sanctions. But in a case like this, it'll just be uh, monetary damages uh, or monetary sanctions. It doesn't have to be damages. It can just be monetary uh, sanctions. And the judge, how you determine what those are, the judge will try and figure out an amount somehow. I wouldn't even really know where to begin with that. Technical question from Tao. There are similar rules as with copyright law to assign costs to a frivolous claim? Yes. Yes, frivolous. Uh, in fact, there's a specific statute. I think it's 17 U.S.C. 505, which is called a fee-shifting statute. If you lose your copyright case, there is a law that allows the judge to give the winning party fees from the losing party. Did the defendants break any rules of procedure with certain statements in their filings, such as addressing Bob directly? No. You are allowed to make speech and act and talk to people that aren't there. Uh, hi. Fourth wall. Um, what kind of speech is restricted by law? Well, some of the most famous examples are that you can't shout fire in a crowded theater. Um, you are not allowed to basically incite panic with your speech. Uh, you are not allowed to dox officials in their public duties. You're not allowed to provide private information about public officials in their public duties. Um, you are not allowed to uh, call for the uh, call for violence against any individual as far as I know. Um, and very few other things. There, there's, uh, there's probably a list. I did not prepare one for this stream, but uh, that sounds like a good idea for a future free speech stream. Maybe Brandon should write that down. My, uh, my background assistant here. Matthew East, what kind of punishment could the plaintiffs and attorneys be facing? Again, uh, monetary sanctions, uh, probably dam pro damages. Whew. Probably monetary sanctions in the form of damages and punishment and or punishment for 
their frivolous actions. Detalti, detati, detati. How much weight do third parties have in litigation? Not a lot. Usually it is up to the parties to sway the judge's opinion. In a civil court case like this, it is literally up to the parties to convince the judge by preponderance of the evidence, which is a 50-yard standard, and the goal, the end zone, is the whole 50 yards. Whoever pushes the ball into their opponent's end zone wins the case. That's it. So they're not given a lot of weight uh, as far as, like, making people's cases or claims. However, the ACLU, that name brings a lot of weight, and an amicus curiae brief while not uh, not precedential or not um, binding or anything like that, the judge will read it and understand it and possibly cite the cases that the ACLU is citing. It's basically assistance. If the judge and the judge's clerk were having any difficulty or had any time constraints, look, at all, all the work is done. All you've got to do is just cite these things. Look, here's a list of cases that you need. Here's the argument. Here's the analysis. It's just presented. It's right there for the judge. It's easy, judge. Just take it. It's right there. So that's that's why they do it, because it, it doesn't necessarily, it's not binding, but it works. It it's It's allowed and it works. What is in Re Charlotte Observer? Uh, let's go back to where it was cited, I think. You know, I could just look. Not character. Charlotte. We'll pull this back up here. So, citing in re Charlotte Observer. It was a case, a Fourth Circuit case in 1999, and they're citing it here for this. Oop, that's not, that's, that's, that's not even, I don't even know what's going on there. Where closure is wholly inefficacious to prevent a perceived harm, that alone suffices to make it constitutionally impermissible. Um, that's a tough sentence to deconstruct. Let's see. Where closure is ineffective to prevent a harm, that alone suffices to make it constitutionally impermissible. So they're saying that, where, that, that this is basically just plaintiffs wanting closure, that doesn't pre that doesn't pre prevent any harm that they're that they're citing, and that should make it impermissible to require that closure. I don't know. Somebody might need to work on that one for me. That is a difficult sentence for my brain to process right now. Adrienne, can you please parse the last sentence before the conclusion again? Yes. You mean the John Oliver was mean to you, Bob? So what? Um, yeah, Adri Adri that might be the one that you were talking about, Adrienne, uh, before that conclusion. I, I, yeah, that's a very difficult sentence. Someone may need to really, I might need to actually read the case and figure out what they're talking about. That would probably be the best thing. Um, if you're looking at the screen, this citation here tells you where to look. If you find the Inri Charlotte Observer case in the uh, uh, the second uh, Second Circuit, uh, or excuse me, the um, I forget what it is. The F second is a is a re reference to a, a collection of um, of cases. And uh, so you have to search for that abbreviation. I forget what the full abbreviation uh, full uh, abbreviation means. Um, it's on page 855. Is what you're going to look for. The case will start on page 850, and you'll find it on 855. In uh, in a modern electronic research, you will see a number with a star next to it that says this is where eight, page 855 started or page 850 started. Things to scroll through it. Um, you know, just regular web website text until you find the uh, the annotation for page 855. That's what that is. At what point might Murray be able to allege harassment? Is that even possible for a public figure in this context? Probably not. I think, I think, um, I don't know. I, I, I think uh, John Oliver would have to be asking for actual direct action against Bob Murray himself before it would even become a possibility that, that, that a, a law has been violated here. Um, so again, calling for for violence against someone or, or some, calling for harassment would be some kind of conspiracy to commit harassment or something like that, or or soliciting of harassment or something. So I could see that. 
So if he's saying you should call Bob Murray on his phone at this number and harass him, that would probably be closer to an actual crime or, or civil violation than anything we've seen today. Tayton Nader, as someone who doesn't live in America, who are the different parties involved here? Uh, Tate, this is Murray Energy is a coal company, and Bob Murray is the owner, founder of that coal company, and there's a number of other uh, coal companies involved here that are all related. I'll scroll up here. They're listed. Marshall County Coal Company, Marion County Coal Company, Harrison County Coal Company, Ohio County Coal Company, Murray Energy Corporation, and Robert Murray. And the those are plaintiffs. And the defendants are John Oliver, Charlie Wilson of uh, HBO and uh, Time Warner Productions. Uh, John Oliver and Charles Wilson, or at least John Oliver, uh, their their show is is held under the LLC titled Partially Important Productions, which I always thought was kind of funny. So let's see here. Kyle asks, does the court system in the U.S. have any way of addressing vexatious litigants, and if so, do you think Mr. Murray might be getting close to that point? Yes, this is the way of addressing vexatious litigants, is to request sanctions, um, get, get a case dismissed, uh, uh, and then request sanctions. There's also actual laws, I forget their numbers, but uh, that, you can, that, that, that cover frivolous lawsuits and you can file a count. A, a claim within a lawsuit for that exact claim. Refs stand behind pens. What legal precedent or case would Murray or Murray Energy have to believe their statements are enough to win them the case as a whole on the grounds of defamation? I don't know. I, I don't. Um, one, I'm not yet and may never be, but I consider myself an enthusiast of First Amendment law. Um, and while I am an, an enthusiast of First Amendment law, I am not anywhere near an expert and do not know what basis they could possibly have for this to be considered defamation. Um, defamation has to be a, a, a false statement that results in actual damage. That's an oversimplification. So we, they, they have to point to a false statement that results in actual damage. And rhetoric on an entertainment news show is not a false factual statement so i'm not sure what what their basis could possibly be what is libel and slander libel and slander are defamation they are a, they are a subclass of defamation libel is uh, written defamation and slander is spoken defamation it, they are used less and less because the term defamation encompasses them quite well but libel is written and slander is spoken. You can remember that because of the dual S's. Slander is spoken, slander is spoken. So then libel is written, slander is spoken. Craig, is there a situation where a lawyer that files a case with no legal merit may lose or be forced to retake his bar? Yes. Not really lose his license, but they can be sanctioned with disciplinary action. You may remember John Steele of Prenda Law fame who did file lots of frivolous stuff and did eventually get hit with many criminal actions or cr criminal charges against him and voluntarily gave up his law license in a plea deal. Um, and I think that was officially done like a month ago or something like that. Can Oliver discuss the case on his show? Yes, Ty. Yes, Oliver can discuss the case on his show. No, he's not going to. HBO's lawyers have definitely asked him not to, or at least that's what he's telling everyone. So I recommend, or why, why would I recommend? I, I'm assuming uh, that, that he has accepted their recommendation and he is not talking about it. But as far as I know, there is no gag order on this case yet. And even then, the, the gag order would only limit certain kinds of speech. So as far as I know, he is not limited by the court. He is limited by practicality, good idea, uh, don't want to hurt his case going forward. So he's taking his lawyer's advice and he's not speaking about it. 
Uh, why don't I like the combination of the words a myriad of? Well, myriad means many. So if you said the words a many of, that would uh, that would just sound weird. So if I have many dogs, I have myriad dogs. If I have many different dogs, I have myriad different dogs. I don't say I have a myriad of different dogs. I say I have myriad different dogs. However, it has been so terribly misused that it is official, and now a myriad of is an officially grammatically correct version of it, as far as I know. Someone can correct me. I still don't like it. Do you know what, if anything, HBO Oliver has filed in response at this point? No, I have not. Uh, I'm assuming they've responded with an answer or some kind of motion for more time. Um, a temporary restraining order does not require Oliver's response, so... Uh, it's possible that nothing has been filed. This is document 26 that I'm looking at. I have not looked at the docket, and I'm not prepared to do that right now. So there have been 25 previous documents filed. I'm assuming one of those is an answer or some kind of response from uh, um, HBO. Actually, it's probably not an answer. They're probably going to be filing a motion to dismiss, if anything else. What is going on with my stream? Okay, thank you. Yellow, red, yellow, red, yellow, red. Drop down to four, four megabits for a moment there. Okay. That looks like a good place to stop. Does Bob speaking on Fox News make it less likely that he can get a gag order? Yes, someone should point that out. I'm assuming that was pointed out in here someplace. Uh, but but Bob should not be speaking on Fox News. That uh, that's not going to be good for his his statement that John Oliver presented his ideas in a forum that that uh, Bob doesn't have access to, which is the public forum. So how is it that Bob is speaking to Fox News while complaining that he doesn't have access to the public forum? So that's bullshit. So um, yeah. That is one of the more ridiculous things I've seen in a while. And I've seen some pretty ridiculous things late recently. So, um, hmm. Anyway, thank you for joining me. I'm going to hit this button and see... Oh, any chance of doggos tonight? Yes, sure. Let's get a dog in here. Do I need to get, like, dog treats or something? Let's grab a dog treat. We went and ran we, we went and ran around in the kiddie pool for like an hour today. So they're all tired. Yosa, come here. It's it's you're on. It's your time. Can you come up? Oh yeah. Good girl. Can you come up? Oh come on, you climb up here all the time. Come on, up. Come on. All right, well, I'll give it to you and then I'm going to pick you up. Because you're my dog. All right, let me... Okay, there we go. This is Nico. Nico says hi. Um, yes, and for anyone who just asked about an H3H3 update, there is no H3H3 update. I literally checked... Ten minutes before we went on. Those are my summer shorts. <sighs> I love this dog. He is the best dog. He is very calm. He is very quiet. He loves me. What mic noises? <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Whoop. There will never be an H3H3 update. <laughs> uh, all right, everyone. Thank you very much for joining me. 
I would like to thank a few of my sponsors real quick. One, I would like to thank New Sensei, my first sponsor of an entire video. And while this is not that video, I did want to recognize him. He has sponsored a video that will be coming out later this month called the, uh, what we think, called The Basics of Copyright for YouTube Creators. And I'm going to try and sum uh, summarize uh, what, um, you know, what, what copyright means for a YouTube creator and, you know, answer some of these myths and questions like how much of something do I have to change before I can call it mine? Because that's not the way copyright works. I would also like to thank uh, my $50 plus supporters, uh, Joshua Meinsicker, Baxorn, John Cripps, Nate Beck, John Steele, Weston Loney, and Lydia Collinson. Thank you very much for your support. It is very much appreciated. And thank you to all of my $5 plus supporters that are scrolling on the uh, panel behind me that will be listed in the description of this video when it posts to, uh, uh, to YouTube as an archive. And um, I thank you all very, very, very much for your support. I have taken active steps. I am no longer accepting family law cases. I'm ramping down traffic cases. I'm no longer accepting criminal cases. And the time is being devoted to you. So I, I meant to start that much more in August, but the Alex Maurer situation kind of got us all sidetracked. It was a bit of an emergency. And then... Um, I had lots of catching up to do to get all of the things that had been pushed out of the way back into order. So I'm getting through all of that now, and August should be a much more video plentiful month. There will be myriad videos in August. So thank you very much for joining me. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and uh, I'll see you in my next video. Oh, what will that be? The next video will probably be the Hairbrain Schemes Battletech lawsuit from Harmony Gold. This is a more complex one. Every time I think I've gotten this one ready to shoot, there's more to it. I've got a very long thread I want I have to go through on a, on a forum to find out some things. Um, then I want to talk about the YouTube Adpocalypse lawsuit that came from Zombies Go Boom, I think that was. So that's what we're doing next. Now I'm ready to go. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. Thank you again for joining me, and have a great week.